So I've been explaining to all of my friends in London that I am very fond of Bulgaria, or if not, I would have left a long time ago. I would have headed out. But I couldn't because I was so much looking forward to meeting you here tonight and, and to give this talk and to meet some of my old friends and colleagues uh, again. And it really, it really is a pleasure. Let me also start by congratulating you on the book, which I think is the first work of its kind in Bulgaria. And it's truly a significant book. I've been looking at it. And I do think in terms of the kind of information sources that you use for it, there are very few uh, uh, more updated works on this period in terms of sino soviet relations and Chinese foreign policy in any language. So you should definitely make use of the opportunity to read it while you now have the opportunity to do it in your home language. It is quite a feat. It's quite, a, quite an impressive work. Now, speaking about books, and that is what I'm going to do here today, um, as Professor Bayev said, I have been working on different kinds of uh, historical subjects. I'm very much an historian, though I often work on contemporary international affairs. But when I do that, I do it as an historian. I do it as someone who is deeply rooted in the study of the past. And I think it is very important for people who have something to say about current international affairs, and there are many who are trying to say things about current international affairs, to have a solid grounding in history. So for those of you who are young here today and are into your studies, if you want to study contemporary affairs or if you want to project into the future, history is a very good starting point for that. Uh, it's one that is very useful, always served me well. Uh, and in the book that I'm doing uh, now, which is just being published, it's actually published in New York at the end of this month, I try to connect deeper history and more uh, contemporary history with current international affairs uh, with regard to China. And also, as Professor Wei said, I've been working on different kinds of contemporary international history. Um, uh, most recently, quite a lot of World War history, which is in fact what brings me here to Bulgaria. Your archives are some of the most significant archives that we have available in the world for the study of the Cold War. There are a few other places I can think of where you can have as ready access to top level materials right up to the late 1980s. Not just with regard to Bulgaria, but with regard to the world, including Chinese history. I was just reading this afternoon in your archives a conversation between Vietnamese top leadership and Dollar Jilkov in 1980, right after the war between China and Vietnam. Better information that I've had on that in terms of Vietnamese thinking than I've seen from any other source. And you cannot get this material in Moscow. You cannot, you, you know, there are very few other places where you can access it. So again, do make use of that archive if you're working on contemporary history. Don't think you need to get your archives from London or Washington or somewhere else. So why China? Uh, and this is rather simple and straightforward. Uh, China is to me, the most interesting country in the world. It is, and would have been interesting for me, even if it hadn't been the most populous country and the country that is rising the fastest in terms of economic growth. I'm fascinated by China in terms of its complexity, in terms of its deep history, in terms of its background. And I think it is very important to understand it. Now, I ended up working on China myself by accident. Um, when I was very young, I was able to get an exchange studentship to go to Beijing. I was studying languages in Oslo, in Norway. So, uh, probably because they were not so very popular, these studentships, these bursaries, right after the Cultural Revolution, I was given the opportunity to go to Beijing for a year in 1979, which was a fascinating time to be there in. And that was the start of my more than 30 year long now engagement uh, with China. I, I went to study history, but very soon found out I had to study Chinese first. So I began with that. And that is essential. I mean, if you want to work on China seriously, uh, you do need to have the language. I mean, there are no, there's no way around that. You cannot try to approach China from the outside. 
you need to do it from the inside. And that's in a way the starting point for this book. I wanted to write a China-centered history of Chinese foreign affairs over the last 250 years. I wanted to look at the larger structures in terms of how Chinese people have addressed, how they have dealt with the outside world. And in order to get that, I felt, you had to start with the Qing era. You had to go back to the last great empire that ruled China, and you had to take it all the way up to today. It, it is very difficult to understand this larger trajectory of Chinese foreign affairs if you just start in the 20th century. You have to go much further back and to try to deal with issues that are structural, as well, of course, as cultural. I mean, that cultural aspect was, was very important. I do not want to see China in light of what has happened elsewhere. I want to see China from within, even if I'm dealing with China's relations with other countries. Now, it's possible to do that today because there, there is an enormous amount of sources that have become available in China, particularly over the last 10, 15 years. Um, a lot of people would say the study of China, both contemporary China and in history, is much too difficult because China is a political dictatorship. And in political dictatorships, it's difficult to get to information. In Ch China is a political dictatorship, that's absolutely true. And I'll get to that later on. But in terms of access to sources, the country has broadened its approach to a very high degree over the past two decades. And you can now access materials for all of the periods that I'm dealing with in this book without too much trouble. There are still restrictions, materials you're not able to see, obviously. But in terms of what the situation was when I was a student in China, where you would be shot on sight if you tried to get access to any of this information, it is a new world. It is a, it is a very different kind of world. Now, in order to write on China, in this very big picture approach. You first have to have an idea of what China is. And that is not so easy as you could imagine. Because China is somewhat different from other countries in terms of, of what makes it up. Um, and here is the definition that I would give. Rather than talking about China as a country, I say that China is a culture, it is a state, and it's a geographical core. And around this, identities and boundaries and definitions of purpose have changed, have fluctuated, and been, cont been, been contested for a very, very long time. China is primarily, to me, a cultural entity. It has always had an emphasis on its culture. This is what has tied people together. It is only very, very recent that the form of ethnic nationalism that we know in Europe has made its debut in China. It's a 20th century phenomenon. Uh, the emphasis on what you look like and who your ancestors were, um, where you are situated in the country, it's a relatively new definition for 4,000 years of Chinese history, or even more. Being Chinese meant mastering Chinese culture. Mean, meant mastering, first and foremost, the written language. And if you did that, you were Chinese. And if you did not, you were a barbarian. You were on the outside of the city. So, for all of China's history, you have found what we would probably call today an international impact. There have always been people who are not born in China, come to China from the outside who have served the emperor or served the various political movements in the 20th century, uh, and even today. And I write a great deal about them, of course, uh, in the book. But before I get to that, let, let me talk a little bit about the impact that long-term history has on how we understand China today. Because I'm sure a lot of you would be asking, I mean, a lot of my, you know, hedge fund manager friends, yeah, I have some, three to be exact, and, and you know, uh, political uh, leaders and, and, uh, and diplomats 
or all skin. So why is it so important to study the past in order to understand the present? It is primarily because some concepts and perceptions are relatively stable. They endure over a very long period of time. That is not only true in China. I think it is true in a much broader context. But it's particularly true in China because it has a very, very long history. Now, China's long history is not only an advantage. Uh, a lot of my Chinese friends in their darker moments like to talk about the burden of history. They talk about it as a great wall that is cutting off all alternatives from the Chinese. That may be, but it is a fact that that long history impacts how Chinese think about the world today. And what is it they see? What are the key preoccupations that are carried over from history? I, let me just mention three of them, which I deal with at great length in this book. One is a concept of justice, or fairness. For those of you who are Chinese speakers, this is the principle of Li. This is the principle of emphasizing that everything has its fair place. Everything has its natural place um, in the universe. The sun and the stars have their places, the earth has its place, and the same is true in the world. Things should have, they should be connected to a certain sense of enduring just principles, or fair principles. And when people break away from that, they create chaos, uh, they create yuan, they, they create a sense of destruction around them. So, justice is very important in the Chinese uh, concept of things. Now, one has to be careful that we're using this concept, because justice very often means hierarchy. It means, for instance, that when China was relegated from its rightful place at the center of East Asia during this very brief period in historical terms in the 19th and early 20th century, that was unfair. That was something that was unjust. It, was, it broke away from the natural order of things. And the people who were behind that committed a gross injustice to China, which the Chinese people had to work for a very, very long time to set right. If you don't understand that use of the concept of justice, you will never understand where many Chinese leaders come from today. For them, China's re-entry into the primary league, if you could call it, of uh, international affairs is the same thing as correcting an injustice that has been done to China. It's useful to think about how broad this injustice is. I mean, when I read Chinese textbooks on international affairs today, one of the concepts that's very often used is that this injustice really started when Europe started to expand beyond its own borders. The unnaturalness of the international system starts when Europe takes over the world, colonizes the world, and particularly when it takes over three whole continents, North and South America and Australia, exterminate the people who lived there originally and replace them with their own people. The Chinese never did that. And this is something you will see more and more often pointed out in Chinese textbooks. Now to us, including to me, some of this borders on the meaningless. What on earth, as I was trying to explain to my colleagues at Harvard a couple of weeks ago, what, what on earth does this have to do with international affairs today? Um, you know, the, a, a, a number of very good friends of mine friends of mine at Harvard, including Steve Walt, who introduced me, um, were trying to follow my thinking. Why is this important for today? Well, it is important because what this Western expansion meant was unsettling the system and driving China and other countries away from the place that they would naturally have in international affairs. This needs to be set right. So first, concept of justice. Secondly, a sense of rules and rituals. Now, when I, again, to be careful, when I say rules and rituals, I do not mean coming to the emperor's 
court and kowtowing, you know, throwing oneself in front of the emperor and thereby showing its rightful submission to the empire. That's a ritual, but it was not a particularly important ritual, which I'll refer to in a little bit. What this really means is that there were certain rules in terms of behavior, in terms of how people behave towards each other in the family, in the state, and internationally. These have to be recognizable. They don't have to be Chinese, but they have to be recognizable. They have to be generally understood. And this is the reason why the Chinese became so interested in European concepts of international law in the late 19th century, when they were trying to find their own footing again in the world. They tried to understand how this international system that had been created by the West actually worked. And they were horrified to find out that, and this is where I agree with the world, there is no system. It just pretends to be a system which the powerful then violate whenever they see the need to do so. Thirdly, there is a sense of centrality to China. Those of you who know Chinese will know that the Chinese word for China is Zhongguo. The Middle Kingdom of the Central Empire of the Middle State. Order. Now, I'm actually among the skeptics who do not necessarily believe that Zhongguo means Chinese centrality over all other things. What it actually comes out of is uh, the deeper Chinese past, where Chinese culture extended from, which tended to be the central Chinese states, the core Chinese states. Going back to what I had to say about earlier on about the cultural core of China and why that is important. Now, what I really mean by the sense of centrality is the sense of centrality that China has traditionally had within its own region. The concepts that the emperors had of universal rule were never really acted upon. Well, if they had been acted upon in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, China today would have been the most of I happen to think that even if they acted upon it in the, in the uh, 17th and, and early 18th century, we could have come pretty close to that, as I'll talk about in a second. It's not that. It's the centrality within its own region. That region that is dominated by Chinese culture, Confucian learning, and of course Chinese script, Chinese characters. And that goes back to the first principle that I mentioned. Taking that centrality away from China is unjust. It creates a order that should not be. Now, let me talk a little bit before going through some of the key points that I'm making about how the book is constructed. Uh, you probably have already gotten the sense that this is not a book about foreign relations in a narrow sense. This is not just about diplomats and wars and, you know, what people do to each other in, in conflicts and crises. It's much more than that. It's about immigrants and emigrants, people who have left China, the Chinese diaspora plays a very important role in this book, Chinese really outside China. It's about businessmen and businesswomen, uh, both outside China and in the country itself. It's about missionaries who play a very important role in this both missionaries of revolution that have gone abroad from China and Christian missionaries, and to some extent Muslim missionaries as well, who have come to China during, during this period. Uh, so these people, these intermediaries, transmitters between China and the outside world play a very important role in my life. And that influences what is probably the most important central position that are taking it. You can imagine that being a, a, a teacher myself, my students always ask me, so Professor Wester, what is your argument? Because I push them on that themselves. What, what is your central analysis of this book? I, I have to disappoint them because there isn't really one argument. I mean, you can't deal with 250 years of Chinese history and believe that there is just one central argument that you need. Okay, but there is a central position, okay. and that central position is that the making of modern China was a metamorphosis. 
a concept I don't need to explain to anyone who has an orthodox background, if I'm sure there are some of you who do. A metamorphosis, a hybrid that was created from domestic <coughs> and foreign influences alike. And not just for the bad, not just for the negative. The foreign influence in China for a very long time also served in the way some people saw it to set them free, to enable them to do things they otherwise could not have done. This is the point where some of my Chinese friends start worrying about the direction that I'm going in. Uh, you know, have you turned into a defender of imperialism, Professor Wester, they would ask you. Now I haven't. I'm very condemnatory in terms of Western practices in China. But I still believe that the influence that came from the outside in the 19th century especially opened up new horizons, opened up new opportunities. And that a very large number of Chinese were very ready to grab those opportunities and make the best of it for themselves as Chinese, both inside China and, and abroad. Now, in order to understand that modern journey, I think you, we also have to talk a little bit about the inheritance from the imperial past. Um, I sometimes joke to my Chinese friends, China today is an empire that is trying to behave as if it were a national state. Because the current regime in China, the communist regime, has inherited its borders more or less directly from the Qing Empire, with one exception in, in, in half of Cambodia. We generally learn about the Qing when it's breaking down, which really is a process that comes late in the 19th century, for those of you who know the 19th century history. <laughs> It's much more important to talk about the Qing when it was at its peak. And that's why I started the book in 1750, roughly in the middle of the rule of the great Emperor Qianlong, uh, who ruled China for 60 years, just like his grandfather, the great Kangxi Emperor. These were people who were bent on empire, on empire building. And they put together a vast empire in the late 17th and early 17th century uh, that stretched all the way into Central Asia and all the way to the Pacific, even the North Pacific. Uh, it controlled the region, not always through direct military efforts, but certainly in terms of its overall influence. It was a very powerful enemy. I mean, one of the points that I make in the book is that in 1750, China is the most powerful country in the world. Any country that would end up in a war with China, that includes all of the Western states in 1750, would have lost. And they would have lost because China's the difference in terms of technology was not that great. The Westerners had an advantage in some areas, obviously, but the Chinese had been catching up very, very quickly. And they knew how to use this. And the, the, the best example of this, of course, is the relationship between um, between uh, the other expanding empire, Russia, going into East Asia and China. Whenever these two meet up, it is the Russians that have to do with it. And what they do in the end is come up with a great bargain, a settlement, which more or less allows the Qing, the Qing Empire a free hand in those parts of Central Asia and North Asia that they are interested in. And the Chinese then conclude that the Russians could have the frozen law to themselves. That's perfectly all right. As long as we can, as civilized people can dominate the central parts. So the point I'm making here is, I, I think it, to me, is a very, very important one. During its last dynasty, China's power expanded for a much longer period of time than it contracted. The Chinese crisis, if you could call it that, is of relatively short duration by these greater historical standards. It goes from really from the Taiping Rebellion in the mid-19th century, which was a domestically inflicted disease, and up to the revolutions in the 20th century, first the Nationalist Revolution, which did a lot to unify China, and then the Communist Revolution in, in, in 1949. Much of this book deals with the economic and social transition during that period and particularly during the late 19th century and early 20th century. 
I'm very interested in that theory because of that metamorphosis that I was talking about earlier on, because of the introduction of modernity into China during that period and the creation of a hybrid Chinese modernity that still, that still exists. Now, since I'm in Bulgaria, which, like the country I'm originally from, Norway, is a traditionally a relatively poor country on the outskirts of the European South. It is very useful to draw comparisons with China in terms of the, of the establishment of modernity, the use of technology, the expansion of education. Now, in my case, my, my grandparents were peasants. And my parent generation were the ones who moved to the cities. Very much at the same time as the same development took place in China, in the central, in the core parts of China. There is no lag with regard to this. Because if you take China and compare it in terms of modernity with the most advanced parts of England, or the Netherlands, or Northern Italy, yes, there is a difference. But for most of Europe and most of North America, there is really no difference in this, in this respect. That transition, that metamorphosis, happened roughly at the same time in all of these places. Um, I know this, uh, there's a story that I often tell about the great Chinese writer, you will know, Wu Mo Ruo, who uh, talks about his chemistry lesson when he was a young lad in the, in the 1890s. And of course his chemistry teacher, who was taught traditional Chinese chemistry, now had to catch up on Western chemistry texts, and he did a beautiful job of integrating until there was a mistranslation in the textbook where the, the, the concept of um, natural conditions had been translated, mistranslated as uh, the appearance of heavenly dragons. So in the middle of his wonderful expose on chemistry, there are some dragons that come flying. You know, he talks about the flying dragons that come through, and then he jumps back to Western chemistry without missing a beat. This is the kind of hybridity that I'm talking about. But it's the same kind of hybridity that my grandparents' generation would have experienced. Um, the sense that you move from a belief in magic, a belief in, in, in how things are connected, that is magically connected, to Concepts of science. There is no lag. There is no. There is no major difference with regard to this uh, in terms of how these things are done. Now, if you look at 20th century China, I think it's very important to understand how fast things developed from the early 20th century. We have gotten used to thinking about the first part of the 20th century as a kind of disaster for China, and it's only maybe since the Communist Revolution, or maybe in some people's book since the reforms, the economic reforms began uh, in, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, that China has really become a strong and powerful country. It's a much more gradual process than that, particularly if you look at how the economy works. Uh, to some extent, the communist, what the communists did in 1949 was to cut off a process that was already underway and in which very significant and substantial successes had been had in China and returned the Chinese economy to being inward-looking instead of looking outwards. That only lasted for a very brief period of time and it's not the only time in its history, at least its recent history, when China has been inward-looking is during the Maoist campaigns of the 1950s mm. and the 1960s. Normally, China is an outward-looking Restless, as I say in the title of my book, Empire. Um, it is not inward looking. Anyone who would argue that the Chen Long Emperor was inward looking ought to have his mind examined. I mean, it is completely bogus. He was outward looking. And so were most of the 20th century leaders of China, with perhaps the exception of the late Mao Zedong, who increasingly turned in towards China itself with rather, rather disastrous results. Now, I'm not saying this in order to underestimate the successes that China have been going through since the reform era began, roughly at the time when I myself first arrived in China. So I have lived through that period, uh, and I've been working in China almost every year since then. 
the changes are enormous. When, when I first came to China, I was a student at Beida, Peking University. And I remember, uh, you know, if you wanted to have a meal in downtown Beijing, if you wanted to go to a restaurant, there weren't that many restaurants, did you want to go there? You first had to have a permission from your work unit, from your done way. In my case, the college I was in, in order to eat there. You couldn't come up with money. Money didn't exist in the normal sense. It was all political. Then if you walk down one foot, the, the central shopping street as it is today in, Be in Beijing, you didn't see any of the neon lights. There were no lights. I mean, the lights were turned out at 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, a number of people here who experienced China at that point will, will remember this. And look at what it, what, what it is like today. The transformation has been enormous. Now, I want to set off time for questions and answers. I won't go on for, for, for much longer, just go over both questions. Let me talk a little bit about that expansion and what it what it is meant in terms of international affairs. A lot of people today are worried because they're saying that China's expansion has happened so quickly that it is a threat to the rest of the world. I do not believe that that is the case. I think China's rise will have significant implications for East Asia, um, which the Chinese will have to deal with uh, successfully, hopefully, and that the rest of East Asia will also have to deal with. What it means is that China is retaking its place of centrality within the East Asia economy, first of all. But there's still a lot of things that can be done through cooperation, which indeed was the, the case in the past. And the Chinese leaders should know full well that even when they have become the biggest economy in the world, which I think would happen sometime in the next decade, probably towards the end of the next decade, a very large number of Chinese will still be poor. Uh, and that domestic development, on which China depends on the rest of the region, including Japan, is so important that we end up in a conflict with the region that it's situated in would be a disaster. Now, I think, as I said earlier on, that China needs political reform in order to make that transition successful. Because the Chinese polity at the moment is quite weak. It lacks legitimacy among a lot of people, and especially younger people. And it lacks legitimacy not, not just because it is not democratic. I mean, democracy is always a relative term, and it's problematic to use it. Um, but it is not seen as representative. That is the problem. And it's therefore given to ills such as massive corruption and nepotism of various sorts, as we've seen some examples of recently. And it's also given to difficulties, very big difficulties, of governance between the provinces and the center. And those are very big challenges for China that it needs to handle if it is going to become an international great power. So I'm not an optimist and a pessimist with regard to this, if you see it from a Chinese perspective. I'm an optimist in terms of seeing China's rise as they themselves proclaim, as being peaceful. Not because the Chinese are more peaceful than other people, I don't believe in that for a second, but because China's conditions, what actually exists inside China, precondition and emphasis on the peaceful rise. No one would be hurt more by conflict, and particular armed conflict, than the Chinese themselves. Uh, and even the current leadership is very, very much aware of it. So in that sense, that most important sense, I'm an optimist. But I'm a pessimist in the sense of, you know, those who believe that China's overall rise in an international sense will happen in a way which will make it the new central power on a global scale. That China becomes, in a way, to use a, a cliche, the United States of the 21st century. I don't think that is going to happen, probably not at any point during the century. I think it is very unlikely that China would want to take that position, even if it was economically capable of doing it. And you see, a lot of people would say, well, this isn't that good. That's not necessarily good if you think about this in international terms. 
When the world does not have a central power, it is very, in terms of setting the framework, not dominating everything, not occupying other people's countries, but in terms of setting the agenda of international events, it is very often a very unpeaceful place. Think about the last power transition between Great Britain as the international predominant power and the United States between the First and the Second World War. That was a very problematic period in international history. Not because either of these two hegemonic powers wanted it, but because the Americans were so incredibly reluctant to take on the responsibility that great economic and great technological power actually caused. Now, in China, you see some of the same tendencies today. I mean, look at international conflicts over the last few years and see what position China has taken. You know, abstention, basically. I mean, trying to keep out of it as best they can. Now, I teach Chinese diplomats regularly in Beijing and in London. And they would argue strongly with me at this point. They would say, you know, China has a policy. And I say, good, so what is that policy? And they say, sovereignty. And I said, sovereignty is not a policy. Being a great power means taking on great responsibility. It means having ideas and suggestions and plans for how the world is supposed to work. And I think it will take China a very long time to develop that kind of centrality. And I'm not necessarily convinced that that is a good thing. What we have to watch, and I'll land on that now, what we have to watch is how China behaves within its own region over the next decade. If it aims to set up an international regime that is cooperative, for instance in the South China Sea, or in the relationship with Japan, or in what I regard as the most dangerous conflict in the world, in, in Korea, then China will have taken a very long step towards taking a responsible role in global international affairs. But if China is not able to do that, I think it would be in for a very, very difficult time. As American power declined, which we are seeing already, and China's power in economic terms become much more significant than what it is today. But of course it's up to people, not just in China, not just in the United States, everywhere else, including here in Bulgaria, to try to steer through that period. I do think it is very important to be aware that it is coming, that that power shift in these senses, in terms of economic and technological power, is happening. And it's happening very fast. So that's the reason why I wrote this book, that I try to alert people to this in terms of the deeper history. And that is what I wanted to leave you with today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vesta, for your liberating and interesting lecture. Presenting the main ideas in your new book. Of course, reading the book will be much better than having a presentation of it. But, uh, Get the translation into Bulgarian. Uh, I'd like to say that. Uh, <laughs> if you give the writing rights, <laughs> we can negotiate. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that was, in fact, uh, a thing I wanted to say for the, for the end of the lecture. But as you raise it, we may try it, of course. And, uh, Publish a translation either this book or some other books of Professor Vesta in Bulgarian because I, I, I think our students need to read and know his manner of uh, thinking and his uh, books. So you have now the floor for questions, comments, ideas, any kind of qualifications you want. Of course, it's difficult to challenge uh, a writer who has. Oh, please do. I mean, that's what we're here for. Okay. Yeah. What's your opinion? Why is ruling the world to multipolar world or to, how to say, to substitute uh, USA by China? What's your opinion? Mm -hmm. But uh, future in, uh, uh, how to say, every uh, future respect is 20, 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we are heading for now is a multipolar world. I mean, there is no doubt about that. What I said in my lecture is that a multipolar world is not necessarily a more peaceful world. Yes. And I think it is quite likely that over a period of long time, and here we are talking, in my view, at least two generations, 
China did emerge as the predominant power, not in the same way as the United States was today. I think China doesn't have the interventionism that is built into the American project, in my view, for ideological reasons. Um, but I think it probably will learn to take on great responsibility, for good and bad. But it will take a very long time to get there. I mean, to get to that. So what we're having for now, and on this I have absolutely no doubt, uh, for the rest of our lifetimes, is a much more multipolar world, in which there will be several powers that will compete for influence, that will be able to work together, I think, in quite a significant uh, portions. I mean, I, I, as I said, I'm not a pessimist in that respect. I'm not among those who believe in a conflict between the United States and China. I think it is very, very difficult. It's not impossible. It could happen. People are sometimes unbelievably stupid in terms of international events. They don't see the interests that my dear friend Steve Wolf and others want them to see. So that, it could happen. But what connects the two is much more important than what the voice. And what connects them, of course, is first of all economic self-interest. As, as uh, uh, my friend and intellectual sparring partner, Neil Ferguson, likes to say, um, you know, David Fox so close that we can talk about a new global phenomenon, Chimerica, as he calls it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? There must be others. Speak up. I'm part of here. Yeah, between China. Uh, the question was about the relationship between China and Russia now in, and in the future. I think at the moment, uh, to be brutally honest about that, um, Russia has one main purpose from a Chinese point of view, and that is as a supplier of raw materials for China's growth. Um, quite a few Russians like to think about this as a security alliance, a kind of counterpoint to American power in the world, I think they have to be very careful about that. Because the overall concept in China, very strongly held, is of Russia as a declining power, not as a rising power. Um, the concept of BRICS that you will often hear does not exist in China, because Russia is taken out. It's beaches instead. Indonesia is the one that comes in to replace the Russians. Now, the Chinese may turn out to be entirely wrong about this. Um, I'm, not, I'm a, an agnostic when it comes to Russia's future. I think it could be turned around quite easily. But I do not think it can be turned around under the present leadership. I mean, on this, I believe that the Chinese are, are more or less right. So, what one has to watch for then is that central relationship. I mean, I think there is enormous potential for relations between Russia and China to develop well. But only if the Russians are capable of looking after their own interests in dealing with a neighbor who is becoming increasingly powerful and increasingly dependent on Russian and Central Asian raw materials. I mean, again, historically, this is a somewhat dangerous position to be in. Uh, you then need to know what you are doing from a Russian point of view. And not all Russian policymakers uh, that I know have made the leap into the 21st century yet in terms of understanding, to put it bluntly, how the world works. Um, and this can be dangerous when you're dealing with a country of the size and the importance and the enormous drive and vitality as China. Um, I do think there are reasons that have connected the two together uh, of late. The, the fear of Islamist activism in Central Asia has connected to the Shanghai uh, Treaty Organization. Um, the need to 
emphasize principles of sovereignty up against the United States interventionism in the UN have bound them together. But again, as I said, that's not a policy. I mean, that is a you know, reactive kind of approach. You know, to and even there on Syria, I mean, they've had a tremendous falling out of faith. I mean, the, the, uh, the Russians believe, I think, with some reason, that they were <coughs> tricked by the Chinese to go into a frontline position that they didn't want to have. There is some truth in that, actually. Uh, but that is because, in my view, the Chinese, you know, they may not have a policy, but they practice 21st century diplomacy. While the Russians at best practice 20th century diplomacy. You know, and there is a big difference. So, rocky relations, but not necessarily unstable, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, how do you amend uh, this uh, uh, attempt uh, that became uh, very <coughs> popular uh, a few years ago and recently also uh, for the establishment of some kind of uh, East Asian Union? Uh, <coughs> Following the, the uh, uh, example of uh, the, 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 common, the European integration and the uh, uh, European Union, also because there are so many contradictions between yeah. uh, between Japan and uh, China and yeah. uh, South uh, Korea for the leading role in this uh, process. Absolutely. I think, in economic terms, a European style integration between the countries in Northeast Asia, China, South Korea, and Japan, will be very different. Um, as you know, I mean, the past is still very much relevant in these countries, and to some extent stands in the way of cooperation. But it's not the main reason. I mean, the main reason, I think, is the current security situation that exists. As long as the situation on the Korean Peninsula is not resolved, meaning that Korea is not peacefully reunified. Getting this kind of stability in Northeast Asia will be very difficult. Now, if you turn the gaze around and look south, that I think is where China's great opportunity for an economic integration actually is with the ASEAN countries. And this comes to the argument that I outlined earlier on in terms of where China's concentration is. China has over 20 years developed a very successful policy with regard to Southeast Asia. Um, and very, you know, based on Chinese cooperativeness, on broad issues, and even on the Chinese being willing to discuss, if not always negotiate seriously, on issues that have to do with sovereignty, this pain principle. Um, but the question is, what will then happen? when China gets increasingly powerful. And I really wonder about this, because as I said earlier on, this will set the example for what will happen on a global scale, or what people will think will happen on a global scale. And the Chinese have not handled that well. I mean, the last 18 months or so, with regard to the South China Sea issue, especially the, the conflict yes. over uh, access to uh, natural resources in, in the South China Sea, the Chinese have been a disaster. I mean, they have come close to undoing 20 years of very small, very activist diplomacy with regard to, to Southeast Asia. So, you have the ironic situation that ASEAN, the, their cooperation organization, and China just signed what in effect is a free trade agreement, moving towards full free trade between two of the most influential economic zones in the world. But at the same time, the Chinese are undoing all of this by claiming that all of the South China Sea is theirs, which is a ridiculous position to have. And I try to explain this to diplomats in Beijing, and of course they understand it. But this is where the new nationalism is coming in on the Chinese side. It makes it so much more difficult for the government, even if it wanted to, to compromise on these kinds of issues. Now, if the government had been stronger, and this is a point I often make in Beijing, this would have been much better. But the government is not strong on these issues. The current government is afraid of Chinese nationalism. They are afraid that that will challenge them from below. And therefore they do not move to what they ought to have done, which was to sit down around the negotiating table 
and you exactly the same thing as other countries have done, negotiate according to UN principles of 